Welcome to the Open Door. Jim Hannock here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today we discuss the Supreme Court of the United States and promising challenges to abortion in Texas and Mississippi. Then we turn to the pressing issue of designer babies, criteria for brain death, and hospital consolidation. Our welcome guests are Professor of Law Teresa Collette and Associate Professor of Philosophy Mary Hayden Lemons, both of the University of St. Thomas, Minnesota. Professor Collette has been invited to visit Chile this spring as a Fulbright Specialist by the Universidad de los Andes in Santiago. Her visit coincides with Chile's landmark convention to rewrite its constitution. Professor Lemons, a returning guest, is the president of the university faculty uh, for life. Let's begin as we always do in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Professor Collette, Teresa, if we may. Please. You have submitted one, two, three briefs to SCOTUS, also known as the Supreme Court of the United States, related to the Texas and Mississippi cases. Could you please outline your arguments in these briefs? We'll ask you questions along the way, so I hope you let us get a word in edgewise. Well, any good appellate lawyer will tell you that when the judges open their mouth, you close yours. So I will adhere to that rule with my interlocutors here as well. We have three briefs. The I am the director of the Pro-Life Center here at the University of St. Thomas. It is a university authorized but unfunded uh, organization. So, well, we at least get to use the facilities for free. And in that brief, we argued that if the court is going to overrule Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, as the state of Mississippi asked in the Dobbs case, that it also consider its opinion in Doe v. Bolton. Doe v. Bolton was a companion case to the Roe v. Wade case, where a statute that defined the health of the mother was before the court. And the statute itself did not provide any definition. The court taking it upon itself to provide that statutory definition used the broadest possible definition. So that while most Americans think that Roe stands for the proposition that a woman can have an abortion up until the child becomes viable, in fact, the court said the state can prohibit post-viability abortions, but it must always have a health exception. And the court defined that health to include things like the woman's marital status, her age, her economic circumstances, all her psychological health. And so the Pro-Life Center brief argued that we know from experience with a mental health exception to any sort of ban primarily a post-viability ban, that it becomes a wide open invitation to abortion on demand. There was a state statute in California pre-Roe versus Wade that allowed abortions for mental health purposes. And that, that statute was challenged in the California courts on the basis that it was vague. And even though the state of California defined mental health as being a condition that would warrant the institutionalization of the woman for mental health care, okay? Very strict standard that 
abortions were being provided at such a high rate that it was clear that either the medical profession did not understand what the statute required or they were ignoring it. Either way, the court struck the statute down. So the simple fact is that if the court says that uh, abortion can be prescribed throughout the pregnancy, so long as the states have a health exception, as well as a life of the mother exception, what they're effectively doing is continuing the reign of abortion on demand, but in a fairly disingenuous way. So that's the pro-life center brief. It's very short. It's available on the Supreme Court docket. Um, so that if your readers would likely would like to read it, it's about 11 pages long, but it provides the California case and the data from that case in particular. The second brief I was involved with uh, was representing uh, advancing American values and other uh, organizations with one of my former students, Renee Carlson, and we were arguing that abortion broadly has adversely impact American society in a variety of ways, including in creating a mindset in which abortion is the backup to contraception. And so sex outside of the context of a committed relationship becomes easily available with the expectation that pregnancy will never resolve. Well, we all know that when you ignore mother nature, <laughs> bad things happen. And so in this instance, what we're finding is that men are less willing to commit if they've engaged in sexual conduct that results in pregnancy. Women are having sex with men that they would not consider uh, appropriate fathers of their children. And so that whole sex revolution uh, in the 60s and 70s was fueled in part by abortion that was becoming and has become a fail-safe. But it's not just men and women's relationship that it's adversely affected. We would also argue, we do argue in our brief, that it's affected parent-child relationships. In one of the very rare instances in which parents do not direct the medical care of their minor children, the Supreme Court created what's called a judicial bypass. Now, there's actually a case that is pending in the court. Uh, the state of Idaho has asked for the court to hear the matter. We're still awaiting a decision by the court on that. But the way parental involvement in abortion works in this country, per Supreme Court edict, is that if a state is going to re require parental consent for the girl to get an abortion, they must have an alternative procedure where the girl can go to the courts and ask for what's called a judicial bypass. The courts are required to grant that request to allow the girl to have a secret abortion on the basis of an ex parte hearing. And by that, I mean a hearing where no one but the girl and her lawyer are in the courtroom. It must be maintained completely confidentially. So the parents have no idea this is going on. The girl then provides testimony. One study says the average hearing lasts about 15 minutes. And the judges to de determine on that basis of that 15-minute conversation with this young girl that either she's sufficiently mature and well-informed to have an abortion without parental involvement, or if that's not the case, that it is in the girl's best interest to not involve her parents. Now, I'm sure that your viewers and all of the members of this panel can imagine circumstances, tragic circumstances, where in fact, it is not in the girl's best interest to involve her biological parents in any aspect of her life, okay? But those are exceedingly rare. And the vast majority of these requests are granted after a 15-minute hearing on the basis that the girl is sufficiently mature and well-informed, even if the girl appearing in the court is 13 years old, 12 years old. One of the most chilling things that I learned when I was teaching in Texas is there are actually specialists in pediatric obstetrics because, in fact, there are pregnancies of very young girls. The idea that you would engage in either a medical or chemical abortion using drugs that have been known to cause hemorrhaging or engage in a surgical procedure on a young teen 
and then send her back to her parents' home, who are responsible for her care generally, and not have them know that she had undergone this procedure is just mind-boggling to me. And especially without the opportunity of the parent to appear and to make their own argument. I don't know if all of you have children. We raised two wonderful women, uh, our daughters and a son. And the simple fact is that if you'd asked them in high school, if they'd gotten pregnant, if they could tell their parents, their immediate reaction would be, my parents will kill me. Now, that's not the reality in our home. And in fact, because of what I do for a living, we actually had that conversation. And I told them when they were 14 or 15, if you ever find yourself in this circumstance, you need to tell us. Now, here's probably what's going to happen. Daddy's going to get stony silent. I'm going to cry. We're going to go into the bedroom. You may hear a few loud voices. And about an hour later, we're going to come out and we're going to say, okay, baby, what do you want to do? Do you want to have the baby here? Do you want me to try to get a teaching position in South Carolina near Aunt Dorothy? How do, how do we as a family support and help you in this? It's unrealistic to expect that we wouldn't have some strong reaction, that our daughter had put herself in that position. Thankfully, we never had to confront that situation. But our girls knew that we were there for them. And I think that's true of the majority of parents. So there have been a lot of bad things that have come out of abortion. And that was the point of our brief for Amer advancing American values. Vice President Pence's uh, public interest organization and several other organizations. And then let, finally... Let me interject here if I, if I, if I might. Uh, it's my fate to live in the less than great state of California. Now, when the parental consent issue uh, was being considered in California, and of course, uh, in the current situation, it wouldn't even be considered. But when it was being considered, one of the uh, uh, advocates for no parental consent, uh, could put that more directly, uh, a staunch opponent of no parental consent was what today is called an icon. <laughs> now we have icons everywhere today. I think such as our society that most people don't know that they all started in churches. But one of the icons uh, of, of uh, uh, California politics is a woman named Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta was a long time uh, associate and, and close associate of Cesar Chavez. And uh, when we think of Cesar Chavez, I think of uh, the very first regular demonstrating that I did, uh, we would say, no uvas, no uvas, no grapes, no grapes. And this was uh, back in, in the 60s. Now, Dolores Huerta is the mother of 11 children. Uh, she is strongly pro-abortion. Uh, she argued against parental consent, uh, and the public presentation was uh, in too many families uh, it would lead to devastating consequences. And Dolores Huerta won the ear of the Los Angeles Times and one of its uh, most influential uh, uh, correspondence, uh, a fellow named Steve Lopez. And I think that the average Californian would say, uh, good for you that you have that family. Uh, 
we don't much have families like that. And uh, we'd better err on the side of uh, uh, permissiveness rather than impose uh, uh, any kind of parental consent. Now, so much as this the case, uh, you and Mary both teach at Catholic University and a university that's not just Catholic in name only. But when this period was in, in process at Loyola Marymount University, uh, it's physically located on the side of a ravine. And I always refer to it as the university founded on a bluff and maintained on that same premise. <laughs> At Loyola Marymount University, uh, Dolores Huerta was awarded the Marian Award. The Marians being the group of uh, publicly Catholic young women who would like to be Marians. Now, could you say a little bit, if only for my behalf, <laughs> uh, about how you would respond if that were the, uh, the social climate that you found yourself in. Actually, I was part of the California campaign. I was a consultant and also provided written testimony. Ah, uh, you're just the person to ask. <laughs> couple of occasions. So um, the simple fact is that they don't have the data to back it up. Uh, there is, of course, there are tragic cases. That, without a doubt, there are tragic cases. Uh, there are tragic cases of women leaving their babies in trash cans. There are tragic cases of people mowing down demonstrators. There are tragic cases in every instance that you want to um, consider. But the simple fact is the vast majority of parents, and the Supreme Court has affirmed this in almost every other context, the vast majority of parents, both by virtue of their biological relationship, their intimate living conditions, et cetera, want the best for their children. Sometimes they may be misguided by what that means. Sometimes they may uh, weary <laughs> of, of being self-giving. But the simple fact is that our structure is, our American structure is based on the premise that parents have both, the, as the court calls it, the high duty and grave responsibility to direct the upbearing of their children. And for someone to suggest that my child can be secretly taken from my home, have a medical procedure performed on them, and then return to my home with the expectation that I will provide the necessary care and supervision to protect both their physical and emotional health is unrealistic, unfair, and frankly, I believe, notwithstanding the Supreme Court's interpretation, inconsistent with our constitutional protections. It is an intrusion of the family with no warrant other than the unverified testimony of an adolescent in a crisis situation, typically directed by a lawyer that is affiliated with the abortion industry. And so show me the data that the majority of parents don't care and would not take care of their children under these circumstances, because I can surely show you the data that a majority of parents do care about their children's physical and mental health. And so I recognize there are tragic circumstances like that, but we do not legislate on that basis as a general rule. Thank you. We need to look at the, the empirical realities. Uh, I, I'm just wondering now if, if Mario, who has a legal background, <laughs> or, or, and or Christopher, would like to raise a question. Yeah, well, um, I have a few questions, but at, uh, um, I want to ask um, to Mary, Professor Lemons, about uh, uh, if you can give us if there are new few um, pro-life issues that you can mention today, in addition to the one that we already know. Um, first, um, thanks for this opportunity. And once again, I have to remind you, I speak only for myself, not for my institution. And I do think there are four areas of ongoing or 
newly arising issues that are becoming pretty pressing. One of them is um, an interest in um, designer babies. And the reason why this is newly arising is because we now have gene editing technology that allows us to splice into gene certain characteristics. Now, we're not quite at the stage of being able to say, oh, I want a child that's athletic or musical, because that's a little bit further down the road. But what gene splicing does do is uh, allow us to research into curing various genetic diseases. So that's the good side. On the, on the other side is the fact that it could also be used in this way to get a baby designed according to the parent's specification. Now, the reason why I think this is a coming issue is because our age is becoming increasingly materialistic and we have the in vitro fertilization technology available that allows um, the easy manipulation of genetic material. And so um, with in vitro fertilization being so um, popular, it's inculcating the belief that the embryo is, is really not the tiniest human being and that parents really do have the right to um, have a child that meets their specification and the right to deprive that child of being gestated and reared by their biological parents. So uh, I think we need some new laws that restrict um, more effectively genetic research into curing diseases, but not into um, developing designer babies. Is, is there any questions on that? I have more, so. <laughs> Christopher? I'd like to go back to the, um, the legal stuff. Um, stuff, you call well, it yeah. stuff. I'm sorry, I wasn't a happy choice of words. <laughs> an American attitude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious, if Roe versus Wade is overturned and the company um, Supreme Court case Doe, what do you think the social reaction will be? Uh, I'm not convinced that most Americans care one way or the other about abortion. And I, I suspect that most Americans because they're, they're committed to a contraception culture, um, look upon abortion as as a as a, a, a you know a, a, as an as a alternative to, to a contraception or as a, a fail safe for contraception. What do you think the social reaction will be? I'm mean, obviously it's going to differ from state to state. It's going to be different here in Ohio than it is in California, for instance. But what do you think the social? How will people react? Will it actually lead to um, increase in abortion or might it have other um, results? Mary, uh, since that's not a legal question, I think we both have uh, competence to, to speculate on that. And I know that University Faculty for Life has had a number of papers on that. I, I, I'll take the lead and then you know, it seems to me that the reality is that our major media outlets are committed to the abortion industry, and therefore it's hard to have a robust, balanced debate. Uh, you see that in who they select uh, to, to represent the pro-life side, often seeking out the most extreme views, the most... Uh, in artful <laughs> presentations, uh, too often they'll pick uh, a middle-aged or older man to represent the pro-life views and a young, attractive woman to represent the views supporting abortion, when that, in fact, does not mirror the what we know, at least according to polling, to the extent polling's accurate, and we've learned in so many ways in the past decade <laughs> about its deficiencies, but nonetheless, uh, a majority of women are pro-life. Uh, more women are pro-life than men. And so this idea, our young people are increasingly pro-life. I presented the third brief we had on whether uh, abortion actually advances women in society uh, at the University of Chicago last week and got a, a warm but challenging reception, uh, very appropriate, very professional. Um, 
And there were a number of students who agreed that abortion has harmed women's equality. Uh, it's given an easy out to uh, the marketplace instead of adapting to the fact that you've got gifted and talented women who could contribute significantly if you would allow them to simultaneously uh, enjoy and participate in their family life. Um, it's too easy to give a woman, woman a in or out choice. So I, I, I think if we can have a robust debate where we actually look at how our lives have been influenced by the availability of abortion, I think, I think societally we will not see an increase in abortion. Mary, do you, do you agree? Well, I want to agree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I see though that there, that it depends on whether we can break through the, the narrative that's told by mainstream media and, and pop culture. I think that um, perhaps because you are right that the pro-life movement is strengthening in some ways, the kickback in media is becoming even more um, um, strong and emphasizing having an abortion as a celebration of one's womanhood, as a heroic act, as a personification of what it really means to be free and, and, and happy. And so uh, there's, once again, mass media is, you know, trying to build a narrative. And to some degree, I think it's been successful. I noticed in my undergraduates that after the movie about Ruth um, Bader Ginsburg came out, more of them were kind of like outspokenly in favor of abortion. So I think the battle is engaged. So it's, it's, uh, it's going to be an interesting development. I think the mass media is going to scream that this is the end, if, if, if it gets overturned, that this is the end of women's freedom. And hopefully people will be able to um, use your arguments, Teresa, and, and make hay that way. Well, and as Chris noted, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. You know, we've already seen Texas move strongly against the availability of abortion generally. We've seen Idaho move strongly against. So it's not just those backward southern states. We've seen Idaho. We've seen the Dakotas. We've seen uh, there really is a divergent culture state by state. Now, Minnesota, where Mary and I teach, our state Supreme Court has constitutionalized abortion. So Roe could fall tomorrow and it would not make one bit of difference. Um, but it is going to be a state by state battle. Um, and I think we'll win ultimately. Uh, I think the idea that women's fertility is the enemy and a basis for oppression is just crazy talk, it, but we need to be out there and we need to have forums just like this one, which is why I'm so grateful that we've been invited today, uh, to make the case. I agree that <laughs> but when you have state by state that allows voices to break through the narrative that's being pushed by national media. Let me move back to California. <laughs> I haven't left actually. And uh, especially, especially uh, Teresa in conjunction with your third brief. <clears throat> that's 90 pages long. <laughs> it's indeed with lots of tables. <laughs> And I'm not even going to ask you uh, the, the ratio of text to footnotes. I, I know better. I know better than to ask any lawyer about that ratio. However, I want you to know that another influential columnist for the Los Angeles Times, uh, a long time independent radical named Robin Abkarian, uh, Robin Abkarian uh, is one of those who is very clearly, repeatedly, in, in public, uh, front page of the paper, uh, arguing that we ought to celebrate abortion, ought to celebrate it. And yesterday, I sent her your brief. I sent her your brief and uh, the... the headline of the uh, email was 
let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Uh, every once in a while, I like to tweak these unworthies and, and, and do so really on the basis of their, their lack of intellectual grounding. Uh, now, I, I wish you could expand a bit on that, that third brief for us. And then I want to go back to, but, but certainly allowing for Mario and Christopher to interject their thoughts. Then I want to go back to uh, Mary's notion of what uh, encouraging imagination, encouraging uh, a, a wide imagination uh, uh, rather than uh, getting into the same old, same old, same old. Uh, but your third brief, please. We had the privilege of representing 240 professional women and scholars uh, that were all committed to the idea that Roe versus Wade and its subsequent uh, reincarnation, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, have actually not advanced the interest of women. In Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court uh, had the opportunity to overturn Roe versus Wade. And in a very divided opinion uh, that could garner only three justices to the controlling opinion, it's what we call a plurality opinion, um, the court affirmed Roe versus Wade, but basically completely rewrote it on a brand new uh, grounds and ignoring uh, what Roe versus Wade actually said, established a new test. And the plurality, the controlling opinion uh, that Justice O'Connor, the only woman on the court at that time, joined and authored part of, makes the claim that the reason they had to uphold Roe, notwithstanding that some of those three justices would not have created a constitutional right to abortion, um, notwithstanding that fact, they had to uphold Roe because abortion had allowed women to advance in the marketplace, the public square, and it was necessary for women to achieve equality. That's a pretty bold statement. And we went back to the trial court level and tried to find something in the district court that would indicate that the court had any evidence on that fact and discovered there was nothing in the trial court record that addressed that question per se. There were, you know, rhetorical arguments, but there was no evidence. And then we decided, well, we've had 49 years of abortion. Let's see if there's at least a correlation between women's increasing activity in the public square uh, and Abortion rights, if abortion is a necessary precondition, maybe not a sufficient condition, but a necessary precondition, we ought to find a consistent correlation. So as abortion rates go up, women ought to have more access to leadership positions and other indicators of economic progress. And as abortion rates fall, we ought to see women's economic progress uh, retard, go back, uh, regression, those sorts of things. So we literally took government data. Uh, we, the only data that's available is either government data or abortion industry data. And if we learn nothing from the cigarette litigation, we know that industry data does not always accurately uh, reflect uh, things that are occurring. So we took government data, even though we know it's imperfect. And we calculated the abortion ratios. We identified the abortion rates according to the Centers for Disease Control. And then we looked at common indicators that economists use to determine uh, economic progress. And so we looked at things like women's participation in the labor force. We looked at participation by women with uh, college degrees in the labor force. We looked at women's income as uh, compared to men's income. We looked at women's uh, participation in higher education and attaining a college degree. And what we discovered is a couple of things. Number one, there are so many particular events, experiences, factors 
in economic progression that even individuals that are personally in favor of the availability of abortion accept that it's almost an impossible calculation to make. There are too many what the economists would call confounding variables. We simply cannot pull apart the social circumstances. So one of the things, for example, we learned is that since the 1940s, there had been increasing federal legislation to equalize uh, women's activity in the market. So Equal Pay Acts and the Title IX and Title VII and all of this legislation that began 30 years before Roe versus Wade. We also saw that women were increasingly um, holding positions of significant authority in the marketplace. Now, part of that was World War II. I mean, after World War II, it was impossible to say that women are not capable of running manufacturing plants and participating as doctors and participating as lawyers. And it, it was literally impossible because women kept this country going while our men were away at war. And so we saw a tremendous uh, increase of women's participation in those particular fields. Now, it came back then, of course, to some greater degree in 1950, women chose to stay home. There were some real inequities. There's no question. Uh, things like school teachers being required to, to quit when they began showing if they were pregnant, those sorts of things. But those were addressed by the courts and by legislation in the 1960s and 1970s before Roe. And so what we find with Roe is that, yes, there was an explosion of the number of abortions, because remember, abortion was legal in some states before Roe versus Wade by state law, New York being one, Washington state being one, Hawaii being one. So we had some limited data, but what we really looked at is national aggregate data. And, and over the 49 years, we found that there's really no consistent correlation. At the time, abortion was exploding, both in terms of abortion ratio, abortions versus delivery of pregnancies, as well as rates. Women were advancing, but they were, how do we disentangle the fact that several states passed equal rights amendment? The fact that we had non-pregnancy, anti-pregnancy discrimination laws, the fact that we had all of these other things. And we haven't really found any serious scholar that says that you can do that. In fact, the Supreme Court relied, they had one citation, not to evidence, but to a feminist Marxist scholar on this issue. And they said that on her authority, it was clear that abortion led to this. In fact, when you read her book, she says multiple times, quite the opposite that abortion results from these other things often. And so even what they cited did not support their argument, nor does the data. And that's what we presented in our multiple charts. We have statistical tables we've grafted out for the court. And we argue that today, for example, after a decade of declining abortion rates and ratios, women are more likely to have a college degree they are the majority of students in our law schools and medical schools. They have progressed tremendously economically. And so there's simply no consistent correlation. And if you don't have correlation, you can't have causation. We also note, but do not argue, there is some evidence that would support the position that actually widespread availability of abortion on demand has impeded women's progress in light of all these other factors and that we need more research because we have things that at least anecdotally would suggest that's the case. For example, the New York Times three years ago did a wonderful expose on pregnancy discrimination in this country. And the fact, and they had multiple stories, compelling stories. The one that I found the most moving was the story of this young woman that worked at Walmart in one of their warehouses. And her job was to move heavy trays of breads and bakery goods. And she was pregnant. And at the sixth or seventh month, she wanted uh, to have an accommodation, which the law would require. Mm -hmm. And they, the, her supervisor said, hey, I saw Demi Moore do a backflip when she was nine pre months pregnant in a movie, so no, no accommodation. 
there's a lot to say about management that would select that person as a supervisor. But separate from that, it's clearly illegal. And yet the New York Times told story after story after story. With the availability of abortion, it's an easy out for employers. As Michael Bloomberg said, get rid of it if it's going to impede our situation. Again, we can't prove it empirically, but we sure are looking at it. Thank you. Uh, Mario, your turn. Well, I don't know if I can formulate that question, but um, I was uh, listening carefully the second brief, and it seems to me that the issues there are moral issues and values and so on. So ultimately, I have the impression that the issue of abortion is about worldviews, about the meaning of life. And so, and that is very hard to deal with, um, with the law. And, and I have a question regarding this. If abortion became legal 1973 through Roe versus Wade, that um, decision move, and I said a question, did that decision move the culture, the moral culture toward more acceptance of abortion? That's one question. Do we have any data about that? It's possible to have data about that. And the second question is, if now uh, abortion is overturned, will that decision, a legal decision, move the culture toward seeing abortion more an immoral practice? In other words, which one of these normative systems really has more pedagogical uh, force, morality as such, or the legal system as such? And the reason why I'm saying is that when I observe, I'm uh, just observing what is happening in the world, and I just read that you are going to go to Chile. Chile is going through huge changes, which are not constitutional changes. The constitution is a way by which I see you justify moral cultural changes. In other words, the constitution is gonna legitimize a culture which is completely foreign to what we have known about Latin America. So going back to my question, what is the function of the law in all this, it's really important to change the law. I understand it's, it's important, but how then that will affect the culture? I think that's a key question. And I agree with your premise that law often reflects the culture. Rather, it follows the culture rather than leads the culture. I don't think I could say that I can prove necessarily, that Roe versus Wade radicalized the fight. I can tell you, though, that the pro-abortion forces in society succeeded in engrafting the permissive sexuality uh, onto the women's movement. They didn't, that was not a foregone conclusion. It absolutely was not necessary. And one of my co-authors of the third brief, Erica Bacciacci, Bacciaccio, I can never pronounce her last name. Thank goodness she doesn't require me to call her Ms. Um, but Erica's new book is absolutely fabulous. And it talks about the early feminist movement uh, and the dignity and the arguments and the morally compelling arguments that were made on behalf of women's full equality and recognition of our unique gifts and talents. And then you have the March for Women with people wearing hats that are supposed to symbolize an organ, a female organ. Uh, really, this is the best of women. Um, and so she makes that argument very strongly. But it is clear that it was a part of that strategy. In fact, the American Law Institute, one of the moving uh, drivers toward uh, legality of abortion, the American Law Institute received an award from the Playboy Foundation 
which they heralded. I'm a member of the ALI. I'm an elected member of the ALI. They heralded it in their newsletter. And I thought, that's just embarrassing. Why would you, why would you be proud of that? <laughs> so going to your final question, or as I understand your final question, it, at least if we can overturn Roe versus White and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which was a choice made on the justices' morality, seven justices in Roe, three in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, or maybe six if you're going to count the ones that had a disagreement about why, right? If we can return the freedom of the citizens to express their sense of the morality right. of terminating a pregnancy or killing a child, we can at least have the argument. Right now, every argument we're making is in the shadow of the law. And so going back to Mary's point about reproductive technology, every case involving the fate of a frozen tiny person, those frozen embryos, every one of them ultimately has resulted in the death of those embryos, even though there was a progenitor to use the scientific distancing language, or a mother or father who desperately wanted to continue that child's life. That's wrong. We can see that's wrong. And so do I think we're suddenly going to see this reform and everyone's going to exercise sexual restraint and we're going to see chastity return to our culture <laughs> and the clouds of glory will open? <laughs> well, the clouds of glory may open, but that's a different <laughs> But I do think it, it at least begins to equalize the ground upon which we make our arguments. And so I think it will be an important first step. If I could weigh in, I agree with that. I think that overall, that moral culture is what determines things. And so that's one of the reasons why right now we have a tremendous battle over the issue of whether it's moral to kill the unborn or not. And it's a huge, huge thing. I mean, when Roe came in, um, I was an undergraduate and I was like, hey, you know what? It's not a baby. It's just a bunch of tissue and you can remove it without killing anybody. It was just tissue after all. Right. And the justices were saying, hey, we don't know when human life begins. And they had this whole thing about personhood. But now the rhetoric has now they let me rephrase it. Now things have changed and everyone knows it's a little baby. It's the tiniest human. We have the ultrasounds on our refrigerators for the first babies. Look, so this pull toward a moral re. Um, awakening of what abortion really entails is the battle line, one of the battle lines today. And so indeed, the law has not been helpful in this regard for many, many decades, but there is still within the law, or at least within the American culture, the kind of tenuous, but a belief in the in the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and happiness. And that right to life coming out of the Declaration of Independence is something we can appeal to within our culture as a basis for regenerating a more healthy culture. At least I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. Christopher, we haven't heard from you for a bit. I guess I, I'm more skeptical. Um, I'm not sure upon what basis you make the argument that abortion is immoral in this kind of society. I mean, I just read, I don't know if this statistic is true, that 21% of the youngest, younger generation, I think it's teenage, identify themselves as LGBTQ of some sort, um, which, shows, which shows that there's a real disconnect in minds about what the relation of sexual, se the sexual act is to its um, natural term, right? Um, I think, too, that there have been many, many, I mean, almost, I brought this up, I, I hate to, I said this on nauseam on this show, but um, in the history of man, civilizations, I mean, the, the unique civilization which has led to the um, view that abortion and, and inf even infanticide are immoral has been Christian civilization. Um, the Greeks thought that the children they exposed on the hilltops were actual human beings. That didn't seem to matter because the expedience came in, some principle of expedience that we can't have such people in, in, the, in the polis because of a weakening effect on the polis. 
how, I mean, the fact, the simple fact that this is a human being, um, it doesn't seem to be compelling in much of human history, unless you have interposition of a view of man that the Christian faith brings. So how are we, uh, are we can we really make um, an effective argument based merely on, say, the doctrine of individual rights, that you, as is found in the, in, in the Declaration of Independence? Isn't there something that's much more, that much deeper that we have to appeal to? And can and how are we going to appeal that? Appeal to that? Well, it's ironic that you asked that question because I was just reviewing it; just has been posted um, a lecture that I gave for an alumni organization for the university that Mary and I teach at that is seeking a restoration of an authentic Catholic identity. Um, I think James was a little generous in characterizing, although I will say we've not given an award. <laughs> so overall, maybe you're right. Maybe I'm just too despondent about my own university. Um, but that was, on that very same day, I had done an argument about abortion and why Roe had to be overturned and why our brief was important in that effort. And then that evening, we had a celebration of a beautiful mass. It was Candlemas. Uh, and then I was invited to give a 20-minute reflection. And I talked about the necessity of recognizing the Imago Dei in our students, our colleagues, the administrators that <clears throat> we might fight with regularly. <laughs> yeah those uh, and communicating that and the sadness of so many of our students uh, the the deep skepticism they have not only about the world but even about their own value in some ways and that it is only through living example of uh, the Imago Dei in our own being that we reflect the truth the one who is the truth and that we really, it is a necessary precondition for a recovery in this, in this culture. And I think we see the devaluing of our own lives, right? I mean, suicide is a, has increasingly become a problem. Despair, depression. Um, it's not only that they don't believe in the value of other lives, they don't believe in their own value. <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris, I agree with you, and and the opportunities. I served on the Pontifical Council for the Family uh, under Pope Emeritus, or Pope Benedict Emeritus, and briefly under Pope Francis until it was absorbed into a different Pontifical Council. Um, but the opportunities I've had to speak at seminaries and to priests, uh, my argument has always been: look. Uh, you know, at most, I'm the little Dutch girl with her thumb in the dike or her finger in the dike. <laughs> and it, we got to evangelize the culture if we're going to have a vibrant, you know, culture of life. That's, that's a precondition. But having, you know, but I, I can at least create the room where you can fight. <laughs> and that's part of why I'm so excited about going down to Chile is one of the things they want me to specifically address is the importance of religious liberty and the importance of parental rights to direct the upbringing of children. So, you know, and the Southern Hemisphere does generally have a much more healthy culture, uh, at least on that second point. And in many ways on the first, uh, although it's fragile, it's, it's fragile. Uh, so. It, it would be, it would be, if when the law allows us a free reign and gives us religious liberty and give parents rights over their children, et cetera, we do have the ability to navigate. I thought I would just talk a little bit about Jack Maritan. He has a, a adversarial growth law of spirituality. It comes from scripture where the, where the wheat and the chaff grow together and they grow together as more or less challenges. And so when challenges of the age become such that every individual has to kind of stand up and be the salt for their little environment of, of um, witnessing, that's a tremendous, tremendous opportunity. And so I think the fact that the um, role might get overturned on the national level gives us hope. 
And indeed, this is the challenge of being Christian, is it not? To be the salt of the world, which means you're just a little, little pieces, right? You don't throw, you don't make a cake out of two cups of salt. You just have throw in a little teaspoon or so. And so you'll be okay. Good. Now, I have a teacher, I had a teacher, who's actually my dissertation director, who when, when it seemed like she was changing the topic uh, drastically, would always say, by way of easy and natural transition. So, by way of easy and natural tradition, uh, transition, uh, uh, and hoping that Mario will let us go two minutes over. Uh, back to California uh, <laughs> and politics and politics. <laughs> Our current governor, a fellow named Gavin Newsom, welcomes very, Definitely. very publicly uh, people who are, are abortion minded to come to California to, in fact, have the widest possible access to abortion. And in the California state budget, our $20 million has been set aside to encourage medical students to learn to be abortionists. And also promises have been made to eliminate uh, student debts. Uh, on the part of people who are going to go into the abortion industry. Now, we at the American Solidarity Party, <laughs> uh, perhaps a, a, a rivulet at this time, but the wave of the future, we in the American Solidarity Party call him to task on those very points. And simultaneously, we raise this question. Why is it, Governor Newsom, that you have not challenged the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, which is part and parcel of the University of Berkeley, which laboratory presents itself as the center of nuclear stockpile mining, this is their word, mining, and development? What we have here again, talking about a consistent ethics of life, is a commitment on the part of the state of California to foster the kind of nuclear stockpiling that Pope Francis has so often explicitly uh, called us to reject. And once again, what's at issue here is innocent human life and the threat to take innocent human life. So my last question is, uh, any hope for politics? Any hope for politics? Well, I can see that your answer is no. No, I don't believe that. But I've often, during Lent, and we are coming to that season, contemplated that Caesar could have, arguably, I mean, it would not have comported with the divine plan. and so. But Caesar wanted to save Christ's life. The state wanted, his wife had come to him, said, do not let this man be executed. He wanted to save Christ's life, but became fearful of the crowds, became fearful of Caesar. Pontius Pilate did, I'm sorry. Um, and so redemption will not come through politics. And I think the church is really clear on that. But the church is equally clear in Dignitatis Humanae and in a number in the catechism and in the social teachings of the church that we have to leave space. It's our obligation to, to participate as citizens to make sure that there is room for the church to grow and to thrive. And so uh, I, it's not in my normal bio. I ran for Congress in 2010. Um, in a district that I went to one of the organizations I'd done appellate briefs for free that would have cost them probably $75,000 if I'd been billing um, and asked them for their $5,000 donation. And they said, it's such a losing district, we can't back losers. 
<laughs> to which I said, okay, I'll send you a bill for that brief. <laughs> One way or the other, right? Um, so can politics save us? No. But politics is important. On that note of cautious optimism and uh, uh, cautious approval, uh, we close as we always do with a gospel for the day, which oftentimes has a, a direct bearing on the conversation. So today's gospel, very short, is from Mark. John said to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me. For whoever is not against us is, is for us. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Back in the again. Okay. Bye-bye. Godspeed.